In the beginning, all Africa is one, is free. Axa, Memphis, Meroe, Timbuktu. Out of the ageless valley of the Nile, Times riverbed, Nubia rises. Across the desert shifting sands and countless savannas, from lush forests and round hutted villages, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, thrones of the ancient kingdoms. With the changing cycle of the centuries, from beyond the crystal blue horizon come the white men's sailing ships, his whips, coins, crucifix, captivity. Brother against brother, tribe against tribe, blood touches blood. How many migrations, how many generations, how many insurrections before all Africa again is one? Conga, Egypt, Guinea, and the mother of all, Ethiopia, ripped from the wheel and sold into chains across the ocean waves. The enslavement of Africans in Barbados began when the island was colonized by the British in 1627. Among the first party of colonial settlers, was a small group of black people who were captured from a Portuguese vessel. These were immediately categorized by the English as slaves. The black population remained small until the mid 1640s. From then on, the number of blacks increased rapidly as the cultivation of sugarcane for the manufacture of sugar became the dominant activity in the colony. From a few hundred in 1640, the black population rose to 77,000 at the time of the Busser Rebellion in 1816. The white population at that time stood at 16,000. Slavery was finally abolished in the British West Indies in 1838. During the 211 years of its existence in Barbados, blacks here had succeeded in carrying out only one rebellion for self-liberation. This occurred during the Easter period, April 14th to 17th, 1816. The 1816 rebellion, led by Busser, therefore represents the most significant watershed in Barbadian history. What is particularly significant about this rebellion is that it took place 12 years after the blacks in Haiti, led by Toussaint Louverture, made the crucial military and psychological breakthrough when they revolted and defeated their masters during the 1790s, declaring their national independence in 1804. Haiti emerged as the first black republic in the Caribbean, a potent symbol of black liberation for all the other slave colonies. The news of the successive victories of Toussaint and his black slave army over the Spanish, the British, and the French must have sent shivers through the white slave masters across the region. The long reverberations of the Haitian Revolution echoed in the 1816 rebellion in Barbados, the first of three major black uprisings that took place in the British West Indies between the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and the end of slavery in 1838. The other two rebellions followed in Demerara in 1823 and Jamaica in 1831. These rebellions demonstrated that blacks, realizing that the imperial government and the local slave-owning class were unwilling to enact legislation to free them, took steps to ensure their own emancipation. The Barbadian Rebellion threw up a leader of unbending intent in the person of Bussa, an African-born enslaved man, chief ranger at Bailey's Plantation in the parish of St. Philip. In the folk culture of this island, he is recognized as a man who, having organized his fellow blacks into a military force, led them into action against both the local militia and the imperial troops. As such, Bussa emerges from the military record 
and the folk memory as a central figure of the uprising. Historians cannot just accept evidence of critically. Part of our craft is knowing how to look at the logic of evidence. My task was really uh, to look at not only the official documents of Parliament, the official documents of the Assembly, the oral tradition, the documents produced by the British Army and military, which was based in Barbados and which intervened in rebellion, and emerged with an interpretation. It is the seminal moment, I believe, in early Barbados history where the, the people of this island took a decision collectively to overthrow slavery and to usher in a new dispensation. We know from the structure of the evidence that Buffer was the principal leader of this. Uh, there has been considerable contention around this point. The Assembly's report was intended to prove that the rebellion had its origins in the anti-slavery movement of England, that it was because Wilberforce and the English anti-slavery movement had interfered in the local circumstances. And they said that the black people of Barbados were satisfied with slavery. And it's this external influence from British politics that has destabilized their reality. So the purpose of the report was to indict Wilberforce and not to give us an assessment of the rebellion itself. So it was a political document that most historians have discredited the document as a legitimate source. Not only myself, but Professor Michael Creighton, who has written extensively on this subject, have said it was a political document and we ought not to take it very seriously. I move from there into looking at the records of the British Army. And I believe that these soldiers, as part of their military culture, as part of the training, to document the circumstances before them. And in their documents, they said, the rebels are coming in all through the night from the north, from the east, from the west. Should we attack them now? The instruction came, wait until tomorrow morning. And meanwhile, Bailey's plantation, where Bustle has established headquarters, this is where the final battle takes place. Professor Handler and many other people have found it a coincidence that of the 182 plantations on this island that had experienced rebellion, that it was a coincidence that these rebel leaders from all over the island are converging on the one plantation. And I say, if that's a coincidence, it is the most extraordinary coincidence. We move now into the oral tradition. The people of Barbados, of all races, remember the rebellion as Bustle's rebellion. The oral memory, the traditional memory, reinforce the evidence as presented by the British government. Near the 1970s, when I started my work in 1816, I decided to complement the official sources with oral history. Therefore, I went into St. Philip and interviewed a number of elderly people who had memories that had been transmitted to them from their grandparents and great-grandparents who had been alive during the time of 1816. What came across quite clearly was that two names surfaced and remained in the folk memory, that of Busser and that of Washington Franklin. Clearly then, from evidence from below, history from below, the two most important individuals of 1816 are Busser and Washington Franklin. Critical to the central issue regarding Busser's status as a principal leader of the 1816 rebellion is the integrally related matter of his African as opposed to Creole identity. We know that he was an African born uh, individual. That is striking in itself because this is a time in Barbados where less than 5% of the black people on this island were born in Africa. But it's interesting later on in 1914. One Mr. Thinker produced the handbook for Barbados. And in this handbook is a chapter called Buffer's Rebellion. And then he proceeds to say that the rebellion of the people of Barbados was led by an African slave by the name of Buffer. Buffer was perhaps a member of the Busa Nation, a faction of the powerful Mande people who spread over West Africa during the 14th and 15th centuries as traders and conquerors. The Mande brought Islamic culture to the House of People in what is now northern Nigeria, but the Busu people had settled at the crossing of the Niger on the famous southwest trading route from Hausa Katsina to Ashanti. Busu would have brought to Barbados these characteristics of his people. Basa and his fellow elite conspirators were said to have had a large measure of political and psychological control over the common field workers. It is not known in what year Busa arrived in Barbados. The 
slave trade had been terminated in 1807, and it would have taken Bussa at least 10 years in Barbados to acquire the language skills and his owner's confidence in order to be elevated into the labor elite. It is possible, therefore, that when he led his fellow blacks into rebellion, he was a man of between 30 and 40 years of age. Like Moses in Egypt, Bussa must have had his own supreme moment of crisis, provoking some irrevocable action on his part, which would have brought him face to face with his destiny and led him to intervene on behalf of his downtrodden people. Bussa's African identity, no doubt, represented for many Creole blacks a cultural freshness, an uncompromising determination for freedom. African-born Negroes are more bloody-minded than Creole because the spirit of the former has not been entirely bowed down and crushed under the yoke of slavery in the light of the pervasive anti-African prejudice of his time, Bussell's achievement was clearly one of historically significant proportions. So Bussell would have realized perhaps the ultimate futility of his blow for freedom, yet he carried it through. Carried it through from the planning to the firing of the first kings at Bailey's plantation on Easter Monday morning, the 14th of April, 1816. Carried it through when the battles and campaigns went against him, for example, at Lowther's, etc. And that final battle at Bailey's plantation when the slaves made a stand around his dead body is symbolic of the importance of Bussa in the history not only of slave revolts, but of Barbados. For here was an African Barbadian saying, I will not be a slave. I will lead my people like Moses into the promised land, or I will die fighting for that. Bussa's remarkable achievement was that he forged a rebel leadership out of the planter-elevated slave elite and led it in the field for the attainment of black liberation. The vast majority of the leaders of this rebellion were people who had the right to travel, who had horses, who moved from estate to estate, carrying out instructions and conducting their trade. Because of the status as overseers and sub-managers, they had greater freedoms and greater liberties. And these were the people who were in a position to cover the terrain. But bear in mind that the day-to-day -day experience of the Arab slave is one of confinement, yeah. is one of imprisonment on the space. But these people, these drivers, these sub-managers and overseers, who were also slaves, had greater freedoms and liberty because they were in a position of management trust. And these were the ones who actually organized and led the rebellion. Bussa's central place in the rebellion was clearly implied by Robert a slave on Simmons Plantation, where Jackie was head driver during the trial, which took place right after the rebellion. Release the prisoner. My boy, Jackie sent me to tell the other riders and the warders and the other captain above and to push up at the elites to turn out of his commander to give a life to the country and to tell everybody what it is for. Here in the documentation, only Busser is referred to by name. Of all the elite blacks, those slaves are our chief favorites and generally ones that we love best. They're the ones that be the foremost of the conspirators. It was the best of times. 
year 1816 was remarkable for having been the greatest return that Providence had ever favored the inhabitants of this island. The rich and extensive parish of St. Philip in particular is peculiarly qualified by the nature of the soil for the production of corn and other provisions. The liberal allowances to the Negroes and the fullness of the granaries evidently proved that. In fact, the blacks were not rebelling because of any sudden crisis in their material living standard. They revolted because it seemed possible that they could transform the overall quality of their social existence by this extreme. It is possible to crudely outline the nature of Bussell's outer world at Bailey's plantation. In April 1816, there were some 350 enslaved blacks on the estate. The manager of the estate was Edward Thomas Esquire. Thomas gave evidence before the assembly select committee which investigated the rebellion. It is clear that the report paints a glorious pre-rebellion image of Barbadian slave society. For example, Thomas testified that St. Philip was a great corn country and that, to quote him, the season preceding the insurrection was the most abundant he ever knew. The storehouses were full of yams and edibles. Each Negro had as much dinner as he could eat, ready prepared, consisting of one and a half pounds of cuckoo or two pounds of roots, with a soup made of peas or esculent vegetables, a great abundance of okras and pumpkins which are grown. These are also distributed. The drivers, mechanics, and other officers had gardens of their own to cultivate. However, contrary to his testimony, Thomas was known to be a cruel taskmaster. A great part of the ginger exported from this island is raised by the Negroes in their gardens. Some of them known to make from 10 pounds to 20 pounds per annum from the sale of their ginger. Here at Bailey's, the slaves go into the field at 6 o'clock in the morning, work till 9 o'clock where a half an hour is allocated for breakfast, and then they go to work again and come home at 1 o'clock to lunch. At 3 o'clock they return to work. At 6 o'clock they retire from the field for the evening. Literate enslaved blacks had been monitoring the humanitarian movement in the metropole as well as the Haitian Revolution. Who is on our side? We are you see how these flames burn. So we must drink together in a flame of unity. Using the pretext that they were attending a dance, the rebel slaves would steal away under the cover of night to organize themselves for their coming battle for freedom. Nanny Gray, an enslaved female at Simmons' plantation, wanted armed self-liberation. Jackie said, for centuries, rivers of black blood flow upon this land. Now, we have to fight for our freedom. freedom. And you know how we have to fight for it? Tell us, Manny. We have to lay away the plantation. We have to burn them to the ground. We're going to burn them in San Domingue. We're going to burn them in freedom. Many other blacks who preferred to wait and observe what was to go before us would deliver. He was said to have terminated the slave trade in 1807, and this established him as a serious anti-slavery politician among the blacks. Honorable members must have been aware that of recent times there's been an uncharacteristic restlessness and uncooperativeness among our black slave community. This is especially evident among artisan and domestic slaves, the very ones who should have the least cause for complaint. Many of these have suddenly assumed a new spirit of arrogance and vice, unseen in this colony in earlier times. It does not take a genius to draw a connection between this increase in assertiveness among the slaves and the abolitionist campaign being waged in the Imperial Parliament by Mr. Wilberforce. Whatever his motive, this goodly gentleman is determined to bring freedom to the slaves, even if it means the impoverishment of the planters. His most instant cause is a campaign for the registration of all slaves in the colonies, a bill for which he has presented in the Commons. The registry bill was conceived by the members of the House as a preliminary statistical count for Wilberforce's general emancipation plan. The planters discussed the imperial motives, and the blacks discussed the reason for their master's wholesale objection to the bill. Nanny Grigg prepared the ground for the rebellion. 
She constantly relayed to her fellow slaves news of the ongoing struggle for freedom in next door Haiti. Nanny Busser and Jackie took full advantage of the crisis created in Barbadian assembly politics by the registry bill. They propagated information throughout the island, suggesting that both local and English papers stated that Mr. Wilberforce's bill was in fact the freedom paper and that as a king's subjects, they should rebel and implement the will of his majesty's parliament, the registry bill, which created these developments, was in fact fully rejected in the house. I would certainly like to voice my violent objection to this proposal. It is nothing more than another salvo in Mr. Wilberforce's shameless campaign for slave emancipation. It would subvert our constitution and destroy some of our best and dearest rights. It should be clear for all and sundry that Mr. Wilberforce is the enemy of the West Indian interest, with a particular disrespect for the Barbadian Santa class. I call on this honorable house to reject this objectionable proposal forthwith. The rebels had outmaneuvered their masters. The slave owners were then forced to launch a campaign in order to convince the blacks at large that the registry bill was in fact not related to any Emancipation Act, which contradicted part of the original argument which they had used in the House in rejecting it. They failed. The campaign for self-liberation had begun and Bussell was regarded by the slaves as their leader and liberator. But critical to the outcome of the 1816 Slave Drivers' Rebellion would be the decisive, if ambivalent, role of the free public. There is another matter of pressing concern to us, and that has to do with the property rights of the free coloreds. As you know, there is now before this honorable house a bill to curtail the right of free coloreds to own property. Many planters are understandably concerned about the concentrations of economic power in the hands of the coloreds. I, myself, think that it is in our own interest to allow the coloreds to own property. It will maintain a certain distance between them and the slaves, and nourish that jealousy which appears to exist between them naturally. This should work to our advantage in the event of any slave revolt. The free coloreds, for their own safety and the security of their property, will be forced to join us in resisting them. On the other hand, to reduce the coloreds to the level of the slaves will cause them to unite in any rebellion against the planters. I am therefore one for the rejection of this bill. In any society, join slavery. We're always a group that could go either way. In all of the rebellions that we have had, we have found that the free color community supported slavery. We have also found a faction of these free color people opposing slavery. Some of them opposed because they have personal memories of their own enslavement. Many of them were slaves, their parents were slaves. So they were in positions where they had, in a, in a sense, an, an heir to freedom. But part of their reality was enslavement. And there were a number of people like this who were involved in the Bussey Rebellion. There were people at King Lewis, for example, who had children that were slaves. And he was concerned about that. His life, though he was a free colored man, was enmeshed in the community of slavery. That was his reality, domestic reality, his social reality. The slaves had their allies among the free colored population. Men like Richard Sargent, Roach, Kane Davis, and most notably, Washington Franklin, who the slave Robert in his confession identified as a close confidant of Jackie, who would say what was to be done, and who had apparently been selected to be governor after victory was won. The role of this flamboyant mulatto, Washington Franklin, has assumed great prominence in the eyes of a few white historians. Three of these are Barbadians. The eminent Sir Alexander Hoyas, Sir Ronnie Hughes, who has researched this area of concern, and Dr. Carl Watson, whose field research first revealed important sources of the oral history of the rebellion. The other historian arguing the case for Franklin's preeminence within the collective leadership of the 1816 uprising is a Jewish American, Professor Jerome Handler a fellow of the Virginia Institute of Humanities, who has published a number of papers on the 1816 Rebellion. Dr. Watson, senior lecturer in history at the University of the West Indies at Cave Hill, who was the first to publish empirical work on the Rebellion, 
contends that it had no single undisputed leader. From the old histories, two names surfaced, Busser and Washington Franklin. However, the primary evidence identified five individuals, core leaders of 1816. Particular attention is given to the role of Washington Franklin. He was the son of a white plantation owner, an African woman, and he grew up as an outside child in the plantation house in St. Philip. I think that imposed tremendous psychological strain on him, and radicalized him. There is evidence that before 1816, Washington Franklin took the side of the slave. Three colored folk, like Kane Davis, Roach, Sergeant, and myself, been with this endeavor from the very start. Ever since I find out that the government of England sent out freedom papers to Barbados, and those wicked slave masters don't want to emancipate the Negroes, the assembly is up in arms over this registry bill. The time has come for battle, and with the free color on the side of your people, we can tell this in favor of freedom. However, Mr. Trevor Marshall, head of the history department of the Barbados Community College, and Professor Hilary Beckles of the University of the West Indies, have cogently refuted the argument put forward by Dr. Watson and company. Now, was Washington Franklin the mastermind of the 1816 revolt? This argumentation is advanced by a number of historians, particularly Jerome Handler and Carl Watson. And their evidence consists of the position offered by a number of slaves, um, mostly under sentence of death, like Robert, and who stated that after the conclusion of a successful slave revolt, Washington Franklin was expected to assume the position of governor and to live at Great Pilgrim. So Franklin is to us, from this evidence, the main man in the rebellion. Um, Franklin may have been present at a lot of the planning meetings. He was perhaps privy to what was being planned, and he may have offered some advice as to how to negotiate with the whites and logistics and matters such as those. But this apart, Franklin still is a nebulous figure. He was arrested at the con after the Bussey Rebellion. He was arraigned on a charge of attempting to overthrow the lawful government of the day, and he was given a summary trial and found guilty and executed. Now, what does that tell us about Franklin, the person? We know that he was considered by the whites a dangerous person, an agitator. He had been making what were called a number of inflammatory speeches, and he had a grievance against the whites in Barbadian society. But does that make him the mastermind of a slave revolt? We know that as a free colored, he was not expected to hold company. It was unlawful for him to hold company with colored slaves and black slaves like Busser. So any evidence that he was associated with them would have counted against him. So there we have it. Franklin, as the mastermind of the slave revolt, I am not persuaded that he was. Hilary Beckles, professor of history, pro vice chancellor at the University of the West Indies, and author of the book Busser, the 1816 Revolution in Barbados, has published extensively on slave resistance in Barbadian history. His authoritative work in this field has placed him at the forefront of a new historical consciousness, still emerging in our region, and dedicated to dismantling the old heritage of slavery that continues to exercise considerable power over black people's understanding of their history. Franklin, who the assembly says, was the chief culprit behind the circumstance. This is a man who was disenfranchised by his white brothers. He had property, he had lost it by virtue of the fact that his father's legacy to him was taken from him. And he became a very dissatisfied individual in terms of the society of St. Philip. And there is some evidence to suggest that he had a problem with the white community of St. Philip. In fact, during the circumstances of the rebellion, what they did was to take this man into the house and put a rubber on his neck. The report of the assembly in itself was an attempt to justify the murder of this man. He might have been involved in the community of the black people with respect to fomenting this circumstance, but he was not a leader. In the 1876 documentation, the only name that emerges there is General Bassa. His name does not appear in those documentation and subsequent rebellions. And that would not have been the case had he been the people's leader. The outbreak of extensive arson, which signified the start of the rebellion, began about 8.30 p.m. on the 14th of April, 1816, in the southeastern parish of St. Philip. From there, the rebellion quickly spread throughout the southern and central parishes of Christchurch, 
St. John and St. Thomas, St. George and parts of St. Michael. The rebellion was short-lived. Within four days, it was effectively squashed by a joint offensive of local militia and imperial troops garrisoned on the island. The death toll was unevenly balanced between blacks and whites. Governor Leith, in his report of the 30th of April, stated, It is impossible with any certainty to state the numbers who have fallen. About 50, however, are at present conjectured to be the amount. The number executed under martial law have been about 70. The anonymous author of an account of the insurrection, however, stated that little short of 1,000 blacks were killed in battle and executed at law. Only one white militiaman was killed in battle, one Brewster, a private in the St. Philip Parish militia. Several militiamen, however, were seriously injured in combat. In addition, during the clashes between blacks and the imperial troops, two of the 150 men of the West India Regiment were killed. Damages to property were estimated by the Assembly's investigative committee at 175,000 pounds. 25% of the year's sugar crop was burnt, as arson was used extensively by the rebels. The period of the Easter celebrations was chosen for four main reasons. First, the rebels had hoped that the merriment of the white communities following the celebrations of the Easter period would have made them more vulnerable to the military assault. Second, the mid-April period was a height of the harvest and fully grown canes would provide critical cover for their ambush and fight tactics. Third, given that most planters' wealth was tied up in the existing harvests, economically, they were most vulnerable at this time to arsonist attacks. And fourth, Easter symbolized within the blacks' perception of Christian theology, the start of a new life, a final emancipation. The rebels had organized what seemed to be an island-wide conspiracy to overthrow the planter class and to obtain their freedom. Colonel Rycroft Best noted that the rebels had intended the Monday night to be the time for the beginning of an arsonist attack upon the white communities. Canes and buildings were to be burnt to the ground. The Tuesday and Wednesday were for the murder of white men across the island. Data supplied by rebels who confessed during their trials suggest a decentralized form of military organization. Most plantations actively involved in the insurrection produced a rebel group which had a dominant leader. These leaders met frequently to discuss logistics and strategy. Jackie, a Creole black, head driver at Simmons Plantation in St. Philip, was chiefly responsible for the overall coordination of these groups and convened meetings, most of which took place in his huts. It seems probable that much of the planning and organization of the rebellion was done from deep within the belly of caves. Organizers at Bailey's Plantation, apart from Busser, were King Wiltshire, Dick Bailey, and Johnny Cooper. In addition to these individuals, the politicization of the field workers was done by three literate but poor pre-colored men, Kane Davis, Roach, and Richard Sargent. It was only about 12 o'clock that we met a large body of the insurgent slaves in the yard of Lowson Plantation, several of whom were armed with muskets, and who upon seeing the division chaired and cried out to us, come on but were quickly dispersed upon being fired on. Colonel Best, who commanded the Christchurch militia, was credited by the assembly with engineering the defeat of the rebels at Lowlands, the battle believed to have broken their morale and exposed their military weaknesses. Best stated that on arrival at Lowlands, he encountered a rebel force which outnumbered his men by a ratio of four to one. In his own words, Defeat would have been worse than death. One Negro was brandishing his sword. Others were armed with pitchforks on seeing which the militia commenced firing. They gave way immediately to our boys. Those black bastards sure could run. He killed about 30 men and had not even a man wounded. Yes, one slightly by a shot from a pistol. 
the villain was shot down immediately. The free colored people behaved admirably. They would dash singly into a house full of rebels without looking behind for support and dug out the fellows. Colonel Best believed that his free colored men were instrumental in the defeat of the blacks at Lowther's for their loyalty to the whites. The free colors were given an extension of their civil liberties in 1817. Colonel Best suggests that as news of their defeat at Lowther's quickly spread through the southern part of the island. This undermined the confidence and morale of the rebels in St. Philip. Colonel Cod, commandant of the Imperial troops leaving out of the garrison about 10 a.m. on Monday, proceeded through Boarded Hall in St. George, with a force consisting of three field pieces under the command of Major Brown. He called out 150 black men of the 1st West India Regiment to support the 200 men of the 15th Regiment on arrival at the St. Philip border, Colonel Cod dispatched parties in several directions. His detachment met up with men from the St. Philip militia. Both groups rested the night. At daybreak, they jointly attacked the rebels in Sanford Plantation Yard. Many rebels were killed and prisoners taken. It was during this battle that Brewster, the white militiaman, was killed. Rallying around their leader, Busser, Slaves from across the central and southern parishes had regrouped and had begun to assemble at Bailey's for the final showdown. At dawn, the battle at Bailey's commenced between an estimated 400 rebels and 150 men of the 1st West India Regiment. The only substantial armed opposition the slaves had anticipated was that of the planters' militia. As a logical extension of their misguided notion that the imperial government had sent out instructions to free them, some slaves actually believed that the imperial troops would have intervened on their behalf. Still others mistook the black troops for King Christoph's Haitian forces. At any rate, many rebels at Bailey's, on seeing the black soldiers in red uniforms, were initially confused. This was the final, most demoralizing blow. The insurgents did not think that our boys would fight against black men, but thank God they were deceived. When the rebels realized that the Bourbon blacks were there to defeat rather than to assist them, they fired and immediately killed two of them, badly wounding another. After much exchange, 40 rebels were killed and 70 taken prisoner. The majority fled in the face of superior firepower. This was to set the stage for the climax in the unfolding Barbadian tragedy of April 1816. With regard to Bush's ultimate demise, such documentation as exists is contradictory. One historian has argued that Busser escaped and made his way to the coast where he probably met his death. Others are of the opinion that it was during the valiant last stand mounted by the rebels at Babies against the full might of the British Imperial troops that General Pussy lost his life. <laughs> What factors then accounted for the tragic outcome of the 1816 slave rebellion in Barbados? One has to take into account a number of factors. The relatively demand for poverty of the island, the good road structure that existed, and hence the facility with which troops could move from point A to point B. Other factors, of course, which are important are the fact that the slaves were facing professional troops who had muskets, who had fair power, which the slaves did not have. The slaves, remember, were armed with, with swords, cutlasses, and hoes. Another factor is the African troops of the West Indian regiments did not take the side of the slaves, which they had hoped would have been the case. 
both were, and would have been very disconcerting and in fact ultimately resulted in the, in the military defeat of the slaves of 1816. The actions of the slaves in April 1816 indicated that their revolutionary aims were specific and largely non violent They carefully selected the targets, mainly plantation infrastructure, which were to be destroyed. As pointed out by Dr. Watson, although in many cases the blacks had white families at their mercy, in fact, there was no killing of their masters and mistresses by the rebels. In contrast, the plantocracy, backed by British political and military power, was brutal in its response to the revolt. Many blacks lost their lives, but Barbadian slave society was shaken to the foundation. Until 1816, 124 years had elapsed since there had been a major slave revolt. So we see a calm, a pacific Barbados, a condition of oppressive peace. And then that calm is shattered by Bussell's rebellion. Bussell's action, his sacrifice, his martyrdom, gives the lie to the notion that Barbadian slaves were not revolutionary. In 1876, the Parliament of Barbados investigated the rebellion of workers on the island. And it is in the parliamentary papers of that discussion that we find an enormous amount of important and relevant evidence on Busser as a central force in the 1816 rebellion. Why is it that in those parliamentary papers that the martial law which was uh, imposed by the governor was called Busser's martial law? Why is it that the white community given submissions to parliament, stated that they were told by one black person in the rebellion that they will not do as Bussa has done, namely that Bussa's rebellion was in effect a nonviolent rebellion in terms of actions against persons, but now we are knowledgeable with respect to how to use the military technology. The Times of Barbados, the leading newspaper, in their editorial referred to the rebellion of the slaves as the war of General Busser. They carried out research among the oldest inhabitants on the island, and they referred to it as the war of General Busser. It was quite common within the black community for their leaders at moments of rebellion to be called general. Only Busser's name emerges in the parliamentary papers of 1876, the moment of reflection on the slave rebellion Given the central significance of Barbados to the British slave imperium and the wider Caribbean, the very fact of a major rebellion erupting in what was the bastion of slavery was bound to cause severe aftershocks of revolt across the region. Together with the 1823 Demerara and the 1831 Jamaica revolts, Bussell's uprising then impressed upon the imperial government the slave owners could maintain an acceptable level of social stability and security only by means of extreme and brutal repression. The imperial government was not prepared to fully support this new development. For a brief moment, thousands of slaves had risen up and demanded dignity by their courageous action destroying the entire structure of racist lies upon which the slave system rested. Bussell's military leadership took the local anti-slavery movement to its highest peak. And as such, he is seen within the folk hero pantheon Buster, as a fearless champion of humanity and a fighter for liberty. Set me free from the chains of physical captivity. Last of far I rise up across this country. Compass all the force of mental slavery. Buses capture the darkness, shine forth the sunlight. We are the children of the morning sunlight. Buses capture the darkness. He shone forth the sunlight. We are the children of the morning sunlight. Passa, 
General Pasa. Pasa. General Pasa. Both African is a both African. The people of our village wait and take your stand up. Both African is a both African. All of us are children wait and take your stand. Both African is a both African. The people of our village wait and take your stand. Both African is a both African. All of us children wait and take your stand. Rise now, rise now, rise and take your stand. Spirit of the living, black redemption. Rise now, rise now, black man and woman no more. Take your stand, chain from the slave master no more. No more whipping, no more lynching, on the plantation. On the estate, them rape and kill black woman. No more, there's no more fears. A revolution, rise now, rise now, one black name.